thank you, Christina, for the kind introduction and obviously for the invitation to speak here today. Um, and congratulations on your appointment as the Mashtos Chair uh, here at Harvard and, and also really for your committed work uh, in Armenian cultural history, um, heritage especially um, in Artsakh today. Um, I'd like to thank the Harvard Law School Students Association, Armenian Students Association, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and the Kalu School Bankam Foundation for co-sponsoring the talk and for prioritizing Artsakh in this critical time. Some of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be a little bit difficult to hear. Some of it is going to be a little bit difficult to digest. And some of it is going to be really difficult to believe. But if there's one thing I can assure each of you, it's that everything we're going to discuss today is true. It's painfully true, and it is disgustingly true. This is unquestionably one of the most dire moments in recent Armenian history. A moment of existential threat, of torment and trauma, of injustice and indignity. It's a moment that delivers many of us back to a collective memory of unresolved injustice, and at the same time pushes us forward into a sea of ominous uncertainty. The depravity is cemented. It's cemented in my mind, and it's cemented in many of your minds too. I'm absolutely certain of it. The images of an old Armenian man struggling on his back in the grass and weeds as his head is being sawed off with a serrated edged military dagger. Armenian captives crawling on their hands and knees, being prodded like animals by Azerbaijani soldiers with metal poles. A stamp issued by an actual government depicting an exterminator in a hazmat suit cleansing the Gorno Karabakh of Armenians. A military trophy park in Baku showcasing the helmets of fallen Armenian soldiers, gruesome and bloody mannequins of Armenians displayed in a public park for Azerbaijani children to mock and degrade. The president of a state in this century, a century after the genocide, referring to Armenians, to many of us, as dogs. This is not never again. This is not never again at all. Armenian POWs bound and brought to their knees as Azerbaijani soldiers in a sickened euphoria, unloading bullet after bullet after bullet into the heads and backs of young Armenian boys, teenagers, boys barely in their 20s. Then, actually circulating the video on social media, a grotesque victory lap, and it doesn't stop. Her body was mutilated, Azeri Turkish words chiseled into her bare and exposed chest. Her eyes gouged out, stones jammed into her eye sockets in their place. Her fingers chopped off her hands and shoved into her mouth. A young Armenian mother, not much older actually than many of you here. Coexistence. Coexistence as a solution to the Artsakh question you know, it shocks me when policymakers and think tanks in Europe and Washington, even some in Yerevan, suggest that the best outcome for Nagorno-Karabakh would be some sort of protected status within Azerbaijan. Really? Placing Armenians under the control and authority of Azerbaijan right at the time when Genocide Watch has raised the genocide threat level facing Artsakh Armenians to levels 9 and 10? When the Lemkin Institute for Genocide Prevention has warned that Azerbaijan's actions, and I'm going to quote here, are part of a larger genocidal pattern demonstrating Azerbaijan's armenophobia and genocidal intent aimed at the eradication of Armenia, Artsakh, and the Armenians. The solution being pandered by sophisticated parties in this documented reality is actually placing Artsakh Armenians within Azerbaijan. That's a workable solution for the state, for the fate of actual human beings? 
coexistence when 120,000 Armenians remain under total blockade by Azerbaijan, now for more than 85 days, when Azerbaijan has orchestrated a pattern of measures unquestionably aimed at rendering living conditions unbearable for human beings, cutting off heating gas, severing electricity lines, blocking humanitarian aid, and sabotaging its internet and communications links with the outside world. Coexistence where Azerbaijan is seeking to completely isolate and encircle the Gordon-Karabakh. That we even allow this narrative is really appalling. We would never imagine subjecting a population of 120,000 Jews to the authority of a rabid Nazi regime, or any Nazi regime for that matter. Let's give it another try. That would not only be utterly ridiculous, it would be patently inhumane, intellectually vapid, morally bankrupt, and it's disgusting to even imagine. The same is true here. You know, there's a reason why Armenians have a natural aversion to the thought of subjecting other Armenians to the, to the authority of the Baku regime. Actually, there's a number of reasons. Sumgait, Kirovabad, Maratha, Nakhichevan. There's also Ramil Safarov. You may remember him. The Azerbaijani military officer participating in a NATO peace program in Hungary, who broke into the dorm room of an Armenian soldier in the middle of the night and then hacked the young Armenian to death in his sleep with an axe before turning around to hunt his Armenian roommate. Ramil Safarov is not crazy. Ramil Safarov is cultivated. He's a murderer specifically cultivated by the Baku regime. Today, he's a celebrated hero in Azerbaijan. Aliyev extradited him from Hungary, where he had been convicted of murder, welcomed him back to Baku with a bouquet of roses, and not only set him free, but awarded him medals, an apartment, and even back pay for his time incarcerated in Budapest. Let's not fool ourselves. We're facing an authoritarian dictatorship committed to destroying the Armenian people. And this is not hyperbole. Ilham Aliyev said it himself. We will destroy you, he told the Armenian Prime Minister. Just this past September, Aliyev announced the creation of the Goycha Zangezu Republic, a new republic spanning from Gyumri to Sunik in Armenia itself. This new country even opened a representative office in Ankara, with Erdogan's blessing, of course. And before you laugh it off as some, something silly, think about this. Azerbaijani soldiers carry maps of this republic in their pockets, and Yerevan itself is in their maps. And in case we miss the connection, I'd like to remind you that just two years ago, the Turkish president stood next to Aliyev at a military uh, parade in Baku and openly praised Nuri Pasha, the Ottoman leader who executed the eastern flank of the Armenian genocide a century ago. The message is clear, at least to us. So what have we missed? How have we allowed this narrative of coexistence, the idea that Artsakh Armenians can somehow just be part of Azerbaijan as a minority, to be even entertained by the West? How have we allowed this minority rights narrative to grab hold while the narrative of Artsakh self-determination has been neglected as unrealistic or the talk of nationalists? How is it that Europe today can tell Armenia to lower the bar on Artsakh and speak about the Artsakh Armenians from the perspective of minority rights, not as a people with the right to self-determination? How did we get here? It's not just about power politics, not simply might makes right. We Armenians, for more than a century and for far too long, have consoled ourselves with this idea that, you know, things are about, are, are beyond, are about power, big power, that big power is dictated somehow we must simply satisfy ourselves with the outcomes. This is lazy. That's like saying it's all about power politics, is like saying that, uh, you know, suffering a heart attack is just about genetics that nothing else plays a role. We know that's not right. And of course, brute force and power have their place, 
But we know the international world order is a bit more complicated than that. The truth is that states set policies, define state interests, and seek outcomes based on narratives, stories of how they want to see the world, stories of democracy, of free trade, of development, and other themes. There are also narratives that Western states fight against, dictatorship, authoritarianism, fascism, hatred, discrimination, just to name a few. And so the way we tell our story, the language we use to tell our story matters. And it turns out it matters a whole lot. So how does our story fit within these prevailing narratives? How do we tell the story the right way? The stories we tell others, and even the stories we tell ourselves, shape the thinking of interest groups, think tanks, and capitals, and they enter conversations at negotiation tables, in back rooms, and even in the kitchens and livings, living rooms of world leaders. How you tell a story matters, sometimes more than the story itself. And in the world order, in the games played by states in war and peace, International law is one of those storytelling tools. It is one of the ways that states set their narratives in the global world order. It is how states tell other states their stories of what the world should look like and what the world should not look like. And this requires thinking about law differently. I don't think of international law as some sort of positivist discipline. It's not like some simple reference book on the shelf that we can go to and point to say, aha, you know, that's the law. International law is richer than that. At its core, it's a normative discipline. It's a living, young legal regime that is constantly evolving, constantly seeking to understand how the world order should be, constantly shaping the way we should think about the world. And I don't believe that we're powerless in this game. Not at all. We have a role in contributing to the development of these international legal narratives. It's our obligation to tell our story in the language of international law in a way that fits into the themes that states and their leaders actually care about. Nobody's going to do that for us. It's our job to tell our story the right way and to make it compelling. So while we endure the heinous war crimes, the unending struggles of sovereignty and statehood, and the trials of human rights, we must bring ourselves to peer out of this repulsive pit and try, if even for a moment, to tell our story, not in tears or resignation, but in the language that the world speaks when they speak of the international world order. And in doing so, we're going to see that the very concepts, the very legal principles that underpin our own existential uncertainties, our human rights struggles, and even the atrocities that I spoke of, the very legal principles themselves are in a state of monumental flux right now. The scope of war crimes and even the definition of genocide has expanded in our lifetimes. The idea of cultural genocide did not even exist a century ago when Armenian churches, cemeteries, and schools were being ransacked, looted, and desecrated. The term ethnic cleansing did not exist when my ancestors and those of many others here were being driven from their homes and herded into the Syrian desert. Today, it has a definition under international law the systematic forced removal of ethnic, racial, and religious groups from a, from a given area. And along with direct removal, extermination, or deportation of a people, it even includes indirect methods aimed at forced migration, like rendering living conditions so severe, so austere, as to coerce a people to leave and to not return. This should sound familiar as Azerbaijan's total blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh enters its 85th day. We must connect the dots. Nobody's going to do that for us. The concept of sovereignty itself has never been as fashionable a subject as it is right now, not since the Treaty of Westphalia. Today, the principle of sovereignty underpins the discourse of military confrontation in Europe, the narratives of economic sanctions pitting East against West, the limits of cyber warfare, and the question of sovereignty grips Armenia by the jugular. The very principle of self-determination has literally transformed in our lifetimes. It's no longer the simple tool of decolonization. Within the last three decades alone, the United States, NATO, Russia, Europe, and Africa have all spoken and acted in defense 
of the principle of self-determination. And they've done so at some of the most consequential times in their history. Self-determination is how the number of states in the United Nations grew from only 60 in 1950 to more than 190 today. Self-determination is not dead. It's an expanding legal right in international law, richer today than it has ever been before. And of course, it is one of the essential themes that will define the most uncertain and perilous corner of the Armenian experience today, the Gorno Karabakh. Indeed, German Ch Chancellor Olaf Scholz just mentioned the principle of self-determination as one of the guiding principles in the context of the nagorno karabakh conflict itself. So, how does the future of nagorno karabakh actually fit in this constantly evolving legal framework? How does it fit within the expanding legal right of self-determination? How do we tell the story of Artsakh and define the future of Artsakh consistent with the legal narratives that matter? It turns out that under the law of self-determination today, not only is the story of Artsakh in favor of self-determination quite compelling, but the alternative story of placing Artsakh within the control and authority of Azerbaijan fails miserably. The facts not only prove the case for Artsakh self-determination, they also disprove the case for placing Artsakh within the control of Azerbaijan. And I'm gonna explain. Self-determination today comes in two accepted variants. Internal self-determination, which is a protected status within a state, and external self-determination, an independent status outside of a state. The rule as to whether internal or external self-determination applies has become established in the three decades since Atsak's declaration of independence from the Soviet Union in 91. Again, international law is a constantly evolving discipline. This idea of internal self-determination is best exemplified by the case of Quebec. As many of you know, Quebec exercised its right to self-determination and sought to secede from Canada in the mid-1990s. Quebec wanted to be independent of Canada, noting its distinct French heritage, its culture, cultural and linguistic differences, its religious and historical ties to France. It was culturally and linguistically and historically different than the rest of Canada. Quebec wanted to be independent. Now, what's absolutely important to remember is that when Quebec exercised its right to self-determination, the Canadian Army was not assembled at the gates of Montreal with weapons, tanks, and soldiers clamoring to exterminate the Quebecois or force them into the Atlantic. In fact, at no point during the Quebec secessionist movement did the Canadian government seek to exterminate the people of Quebec, to destroy their churches, and to scrape away the front French language from the buildings to chase the Quebecois out of Quebec like dogs. Remember this. When the case reached the Canadian Supreme Court, the outcome was clear. Quebec did not have the right to secede from Canada. In other words, it did not have the right to external self-determination. The Canadian Supreme Court specifically held that the need to protect Quebec's cultural, linguistic, and religious character could be realized through internal self-determination, a protected status within Canada. Canada is a multi-ethnic state, the court reasoned, and, a, and the democratic and institutional guarantees provided by Canada could encompass and protect these cultural and linguistic preferences. Internal self-determination in the Canadian context would not open the door to the ethnic cleansing or genocide of the Quebecois. The context here course, is profoundly different. Azerbaijan has already engaged, and is already engaged right now, in the ethnic cleansing of the Artsakh Armenians. The blockade itself is evidence of that campaign. The Azerbaijani president, parliamentarians, and many cultural figures openly espouse hatred, dehumanization, removal, and extermination of the Artsakh Armenians. Armenophobia has been intentionally and strategically institutionalized in Azerbaijani society. The backstory is unavoidable too. Azerbaijan has already ethnically cleansed Armenians from every city that has fallen under its authority and control. There are no Armenians in Baku, Sumgayat, Kirovabad, Nakhichevan, and since 2020, there are none in Shushi and Hadrut either. 
and there's more. Azerbaijan even labors to cleanse the land itself of any evidence of Armenians, destroying Armenian churches, unearthing entire Armenian cemeteries, scraping away ancient Armenian biblical inscriptions, and claiming that Armenian churches are actually Albanian churches. Just two months ago, the Azerbaijani ambassador actually told the UN Security Council that even the word Nagorno-Karabakh does not exist anymore. The Azerbaijani president said the same thing just a few days ago. Imagine the Canadian ambassador telling the UN Security Council that the word Quebec does not exist anymore. Imagine Justin Trudeau saying that the word Quebec does not exist. The Quebec model, this protected status within another state, may work in the Great White North, but it simply doesn't fit the facts here. Azerbaijan is not Canada. Azerbaijan right now is holding Artsakh Armenians, including women, children, the disabled, the elderly, hostage in a total blockade that is starving and freezing actual human beings in the dead of winter, in complete isolation, and in utter darkness. What comes next has played out like clockwork, from the Armenian Genocide to the Holocaust, from the Rohingyas to Darfur, and from Cambodia to Kosovo. And this is where international law gets interesting. It turns out that in the face of ethnic cleansing and the risk of genocide, which is clearly what we have here, it is external self-determination that is legally required. Again, this was not always the case, but as I said before, international law, like law generally, is a constantly evolving body of norms that take root in the practice of states. The idea of external self-determination has not only taken root in the last 30 years, it has also borne actual fruit. External self-determination in the face of ethnic cleansing or genocide is the Kosovo variant. It is what the West, led by the US, by the US and NATO, demanded in the Kosovo crisis. That recognition of Kosovo's right to self-determination and independence was necessary to prevent ethnic cleansing and genocide. That case went to the International Court of Justice. The court rendered a decision which underpinned the recognition of Kosovo's independent statehood outside of Serbia. And the decision is quite revealing here. The court actually identified what triggers external self-determination. The court held, and I'm going to quote again, the international law of self-determination has developed in such a way as to create a right of independence for peoples, and here's the key language, subject to alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation. The ICJ reasoned when external self-determination is appropriate, when a people faces subjugation, domination, and exploitation. And this makes sense. When a people face ethnic cleansing and genocide, the solution cannot be to push those people into the authority and control of the state seeking to exterminate them. That would be an absurd result. Let's fast forward again to Azerbaijan's blockade of that distant mountain road. There is no question that the Artsakh Armenians stand before the cliff of death or displacement. Under international law, this is precisely where external self-determination is triggered. International law provides external self-determination as a final stopgap measure to prevent ethnic cleansing and genocide, to prevent mass displacement and death. External self-determination is the proper step here. Anything else is really empty semantics, uninformed naivete, or simply the green lighting of the ethnic cleansing and extermination of a people. While ancient and storied, the Armenian nation is still a living nation, a living nation with stories yet to tell and epics yet to write. Artsakh is the heart of that living nation. It's the place where Mesrov Mashtos, over 1,600 years ago, used our alphabet, created the alphabet and used our alphabet in the first school using the script. And Artsakh is the place that 35 years ago sparked the Armenian independence movement itself. Most importantly now, Artsakh is the place where 120,000 of Armenian people stand on their native land against all odds, surrounded by Azerbaijani forces, literally surrounded, intent on their elimination. Artsakh is our story, 
And many of you know this story. It's the story of Van. It's the story of Musadir. It's the story of Armenian national dignity in the face of conquest and subjugation. Allowing the freefall collapse of this foundational pillar of the Armenian nation will have irreparable consequences. And I assure you that peace is not one of them. It will only embolden what is clearly a fascist upstart, one who has thrived in a distracted world order to finish the horrendous objective that every leading human rights organization from Amnesty International to the International Association of Genocide Scholars has read flag is underway. Stories matter. Narratives matter. Getting the self-determination story right paves the road towards genuine security and peace in a manner consistent with the ideals and principles upon which a law-based order should be founded. Getting the self-determination story wrong only opens the door to policies that will exacerbate the conflict inhumanely and quite literally lead human beings to their slaughter. Nagorno-Karabakh is Kosovo, not Quebec. Understanding this may be just enough and just in time to prevent another ungodly and gruesome chapter in our recent human history. Thank you so much. Um, and I, uh, I think we have some time for questions. Sure. If you would be with me a So um, maybe I'll just start while people are thinking, and that is about the case with the International Court of Justice now and, and what's unfolding. Could you talk a little bit about sort of Sure. So uh, it's important to kind of uh, outline what the case is about. And, and the case really hits on, um, it relates to the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which really is kind of the underpinning to, to thinking about how to resolve the, the nagorno karabakh conflict. And the allegations include violations of, by Azerbaijan of the, uh, of the convention, which they are party to and therefore obligated by legal. Um, What's interesting is that in the in the initial order that uh, that came out of the case, uh, the um, the um, the international court uh, has ruled that in fact there is racial discrimination um, targeting Armenian uh, people of Armenian heritage, Armenian background. And what's really interesting in that order is that it, it wasn't just the fact that our, uh, that Azerbaijan should uh, combat uh, that type of racial discrimination but it should combat that racial discrimination from its state apparatus. There was actual language in the court order identifying the fact that this is coming from the highest officials within the, within the government of Azerbaijan. So that's a very important uh, aspect um, and relates directly to, to what I'm talking about here. Um, it's the state institutionalization that is material. Right? Um, in every war, there's all, you know, there, we could hear of instances of, of uh, war crimes and this and that. I think if we talk about war crimes in that sanitized way, it doesn't really do us much good. We have to understand what's actually happening. And when you think about it from that perspective, you understand that it's the mental state that we're most focused on, that we have to be focused on. Because the mental state is what drives the outcomes. Um, most recently, the court held um, that, uh, that, first of all, that there is a blockade and that Azerbaijan should lift the blockade. Compliance with that order has been has been difficult. Obviously, uh, Azerbaijan has not complied with the order, and doesn't look like it's looking to comply with the order. Um, of course, that, that kind of leads us to a larger discussion about you know the enforceability issues with international law. And but I do want to say on that point that there's something there's something really valuable about international law and decisions of the ICJ or even like the European Court of Human Rights that. You know, too often, the skeptics among us will say, well, you know what, these orders aren't, aren't enforceable, nobody enforceable, they aren't enforceable, but nobody enforces them, and nobody can force a state to do this and to do that, um, so what use are they? Um, and it's a fair question, uh, because we here in the United States are used to a very robust enforcement mechanism system that deals with uh, judicial rulings. But we can't um, ignore the fact that often what international law cases do is they take something rather um, intangible and they make it, they, they transform it into something tangible, an actual legal obligation. Um, people shoot facts back and forth and arguments back and forth, but when you have an impartial uh, body making a determination as to whether there's been a violation 
and identify the norms of state behavior that have been violated, um, that's a really powerful uh, tool. And where is it a tool? It's an important tool diplomatically. It's an important tool politically. Um, so even before we get to the enforcement mechanism, the fact that you have these determinations being made um, and constantly being made in favor of Armenia's case um, is evidence of, uh, of number one, what the, that, these, that the acts of Azerbaijan have violated either treaty obligations or other customary, uh, customary norms of international law. But they also create bullets in the chamber of negotiators to be able to use these judgments at the negotiating table and to discuss them in a very tangible way. Questions? Yes, please. Thank you very much for this wonderful uh, presentation and for the work that you have done over the years on behalf of our nation. Uh, just touching on this concept that, uh, you know, um, ICJ, when the ruling of ICJ for Kosovo happened, might have NATO was behind it to sort of create the enforcement opportunities uh, for that to happen. And assuming that, you know, similar things happen in our, in our South, and we do have a lot of precedents, as you have said, with all these different uh, ICJ rulings on our favor that would certainly uh, support uh, a ruling on behalf of self-determination for the people of Artsakh. But how do we go about the enforcement part of that? Because it appears that you know some kind of a superpower or a, a, an entity needs to be motivated to, in, to uh, enforce that. So what are your thoughts on that component? Yeah, and I think that's an important, it's a, it's a really important question because we don't want these discussions of international law to be to be strictly in the theoretical realm, right? For it to have some sort of usefulness for actual human beings, they need to be these principles of international law, these judgments, these ideas, these narratives have to have some sort of concrete uh, deliverable, if you will. Um, I think that uh, in the case of Kosovo, I mean, it's an interesting case in that respect too, is because you had NATO um, that went in and it's actually protected the principle of self-determination that, that was uh, underpinned by, um, by, the ICJ, uh, by the ICJ ruling. Um, we have a very complicated political situation in, in Atsak right now, where there's obviously Russian peacekeepers that are, um, that are uh, protecting, and I use that in, in quotation marks, the, the property, uh, the, the land of the, where the Armenians live. Um, uh, and we also have a, an interesting issue. Now, let's not forget that um, Russia, if you listen to Putin's speech before invading Ukraine, self-determination was one of the ar arguments that he raised, right? I mean, so there's, it's, there's a detrimental effect to the misapplication as well. So we have, there's, there's, there's quite a bit here to, to, uh, to unravel. But I do think that from a practical sense, um, in really pushing the narrative of self-determination in this real dichotomy, right? To say, if, inter if internal, does this look like the Bank or does it look like Kosovo? And then on the ground, actually internationalizing the, uh, the security apparatus that's on the ground right now. And that could come from a number of different places. It could come from the, from the OSCE, it could come from the Security Council. Do we have that kind of political might at this point? I don't see that, um, but you know, often laws of, Law is the is a is a uh, is a leader in terms of uh, kind of charting out the path, right? We have to identify the path that we're going down. And I think ultimately, the way it would be enforced, or that protective mechanism would be enforced, is until there's not the creating the international mechanism. That's another important part here: is that we don't have an international mechanism right now um, to deal with the status of Aksa, right? So creating that international mechanism and having a international um, uh, an internationalized um, uh, force, if you will, or interest groups that are protecting the physical stats as those negotiations are happening, I think is the you know is the real kind of uh, uh, it's the it's the real catch. And there, and I'm not denying the fact that there's this political element is really is really a difficult one, but we need to be pushing in that direction. Um, and so internationalizing the, the mandate that the Russian peacekeepers have, whether that's through just the Security Council uh, um, uh, internationalization, in other words, giving it international uh, cover, or increasing the forces there with international forces. There's been a lot of pushback with the European mission that went to Armenia, a lot of pushback from Russia. Um, so even ask acts of international, internationalization of the entire region is, is, a, is a challenging one. But I don't see any way out of it unless we're able to somehow internationalize the format 
of discussions as well as at these speaking missions. Thank you. Thank you for your thank you for your talk. Uh, you talked about the importance and the power of narratives, um, and I suppose there was the, the the assumption is that that battle has not been <coughs> successfully fought so far. How, how do you how would you suggest changing the narratives and and well, let me just leave it at that. Yeah. Um, so. A couple of things on that point. One, yes, in a lot of ways, those narratives, you know, those narratives have not been successfully fought from the Armenian side, and and we have a disadvantage in that on the Azerbaijani side, you're dealing with an autocracy. They control the message directly. They actually tell people what to say. In a more democratic environment, you don't have that. You have independent players in political society and civic society that are making statements and doing things. For example. What I, one of the things I noticed in terms of how to fix, how to get everybody on the same page is really about knowledge and education. Like, we have to actually tell the story to each other. Or we have to understand why the story is important. And then be able to basically control the message by having everybody focused on the same point. We can't have, there's, there are articles written by Armenians which use phrases like, um, well, since Armenia, uh, since uh, this issue of the blockade, technically, uh, Artsakh is part of Azerbaijan. Now, that from a legal perspective kills an argument that we have been maintain maintaining for 30 years. Right? There is, there is actually an independence process. There is a, a process under the Soviet law of 19, 1991 on secession. Statements like that that are then propagated throughout the world just because somebody's happy to be published in, a, in, in some you know, major magazine actually hurts the narrative because people don't understand and they're skipping over the legal issue, which is even more frustrating, especially for lawyers. Um, so I think one of them is educating ourselves, right, to make sure that we understand why a protected status doesn't work. It's a really important concept. It's not that Armenians don't want to live with or aside with any other nation. We've had no problem living in other nations, in other societies, for centuries. There is something particularly unique about what is happening in Azerbaijan right now that putting Armenians under the control and authority of Azerbaijan is not a workable solution. You know, we look at World War II and the, uh, you know, the, the fall of Germany um, in World War II, the fall of Hitler. The um, denazification of Germany, at a minimum, took 40 years. And some would argue that it's not obliterated. Some would argue today that the rise of neo-Nazis and right-wing politics has created the situation where, you know, uh, it's clear that that ideology has not been erased. Now, what's interesting about that is Germany lost the war. Germany lost the war, and it took them half a century. Lost the war and took them half a century. Here, what we have is just the opposite. Azerbaijan has won the war. It's emboldened. And the liberal, Western liberal democracies are looking at Azerbaijan and turning the other way because whether it's uh, laundering Russian gas to Europe or has energy, uh, is an en ener the new energy supplier for Europe, they're looking away from the, uh, the, uh, the ideology that is propagated. And that's where I think the ICJ case and other cases like that are really helpful because it establishes what exactly is going on. They're not looking at the economic impact of alienating Azerbaijan on Europe, you know, for Europe. What they are looking at is whether or not this, this, uh, these actions by the state violate the norms that Western liberal society believes are the norms that, go that should govern society. So I think uh, our own ed educating ourselves is the first step, and uh, educating ourselves not on what, not the goal that we want necessarily, but why we want that goal. It's not some sort of mad idea about let's, Let's uh, create um, a number of states and have Armenians have another country. And this, this, it, I, we can't simplify it. There's a reason why the solution doesn't work. We're not talking about Armenians living in Greece. We're not talking about Armenians living in Canada. We're talking about Armenians living in a state that is that not only has been adjudged to have done 
uh, to have a pattern of conduct, but we have the actual world, uh, real life examples. So understanding the reason why is really the fundamental step for us um, uh, before we educate the world. It's about ed educating ourselves as to why these, that these two um, options exist, number one, and why one option works and the other cannot. Hey, so um, again, thank you for coming. The talk was fantastic. Uh, obviously, it gets me more angry than I even was as I thought about this in the first place. But you know, as somebody who thinks back to when a million and a half Armenians, I'm 100% I was born here. Um, Mom was born in uh, Georgia, and she was born in Russia, but she was born, my dad was born here. But uh, I've never really been to Armenia, and I know it's not to be any kind of a a world or a political scholar, but you know, I just look at things the way I look at them. So I look back and I think, okay, a million and a half Armenians get massacred. Horrible. Just in everything you explained, uh, obviously much more. You know, people are being dragged out to the desert, raped, murdered, mutilated. It's, it's infuriating. And then I think, okay, is it because back then, you know, uh, it, you know, people didn't know? You know, again, I'm just thinking, you know, so I'm laying in bed just thinking, is it because people didn't know? And I go through all this, and then I, all of a sudden this epitome and the epiphany comes over me while this is going on, and I'm like, look, now everybody knows, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I keep checking every day as I go online, oh, another day, another day, 85 days. And it's like, and it's still, okay, and nobody does anything. And then I think, you know, I see Zelensky, you know, he's, he's going, you know, he's like slamming the bell on the New York Stock Exchange. He's, you know, uh, America's sending billions all over to them. It's like, no, I went to the lecture about a month ago that was here, and I asked the professor there, I said, so, so who's helping Armenia? And he said, nobody. And, and, and that's really my question. It's like, is anybody in Armenia in the government? Like, nobody seems to be making phone calls help us. And I'm not even talking more physically helping, as in like military help. You know, they're just stuck out there, you know? And, uh, and over here, it, it's just infuriating to me. I just don't understand how 120,000 people can be stuck like that. Everybody knows, whereas again, I'll even say maybe in the past, right, with a million that, maybe everyone didn't know, right? I don't know, but maybe. Today everybody knows. How is that even possible? It just, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. It, it, I mean, that's really the question, and I don't know if there is, there is no answer, right? Like, yeah, well, I think, you know, it's interesting that you bring up that question because um, I, would, I would lie if I told you that I didn't have the same feeling, right? That I actually believed growing up that if people knew if people just had access to information, that, and maybe many of you thought that too, that if people had access to information, the genocide would not have happened, right? Or that it would have been stemmed in some way, or, um, or there would have been more assistance. Global, and you know, and, and as I've kind of practiced in this area, um, and it's something that, I don't know, I'm sure some of you know Umit Kurt, right, who was, um, uh, scholar who had actually focused on the Aintep Armenians and had written quite a bit about how the genocide was perpetrated there. And he was at the University of Chicago a, few, uh, a couple of weeks ago and I spoke with him there too. And it made me think that, you know, I was listening to what he was, what he was talking about, um, about the microeconomic issues that were involved in the genocide. In other words, the order that came down to annihilate the Armenians in, in uh, Aintep, right? couldn't have actually executed the genocide itself unless you had willing participants in the town, on the streets, doing the work of genocide. And so he was focused on what motivated individual people, right? There was a lot of ideology. There were also economic interests that were at play, right? People, you know, when people lost homes, people got homes. Uh, things were, you know, they were, you know, he showed charts of, you know, people were buying at, at auctions, uh, you know, things like spoons and plates of, these Armenians that had been deported. Um, so, uh, you know, so obviously, you know, I really believe that, you know, if people knew um, the outcome would have been different. And here we have an example that shows that people, um, people do know. And yet we have almost, and it's almost shocking because the law itself, and, and we think that the international society has progressed to the point um, where we would not allow this type of thing to take place. Now, unfortunately, Armenians are not the only one whose struggle is is uh, is not mentioned, in, especially in like Western press. And what I've realized is that these narratives are really important in 
um, in shading and shaping public opinion as to how to approach a certain subject. And, and the beauty of this kind of, how does this come, I mean, you brought up the example, right? We have this, this, uh, this massive distinction between how we are told to approach, and when I say told, I mean we are told, because even during the war, um, even in articles I've published, I've had editors come back to me from large American, say you have to take out that word. And it's no surprise what those words are. You have to take out that word, you have to do this, you have to do that. And you get editorial uh, you know, commentary on anything you publish, right? That's normal. But when it's, when, when it's about the narrative, right, that you can't use that word. Let's stay away from the word ethnic cleansing. Let's stay away, away from the word genocide. In normal, uh, publications that you would think are not influenced by, you know, but when it comes to the, the Ukraine situation, you know, the gamut of language is, is not only available, but it's encouraged. Why is, this, why is this word not there? Let's throw that in. So to answer your question, why? Um, why that happens. I think that there, there are a lot of interests that we're going to learn over the, uh, the upcoming months. Um, you know, people don't care about human rights as much as we think they do. They really don't. Um, especially perpetrators or people benefiting from, uh, from human rights violations. And there are a lot of people that benefit from human rights violations. I think many of us may have been shocked when we saw the trilateral statement that was signed in November 2020 when the last line of the, you know, point nine was about opening rail connections and you know what does that have to do with, with what just happened that's how my, my instant reaction was that but we're going to learn and, and i say we're going to learn because things are happening over the next few months that we're are really going to expose um, what these real interests are and it's absolutely shocking and our problem our problem is that we speak of uh human rights uh, in the human rights discourse. The, the perpetrator doesn't care about that discourse. You can't convince somebody of the wrong, of the, the illegality or the Im uh, immorality of their conduct by talking about human rights. You have to speak in the narrative that makes a difference to them, right? You have to show them that the, the encouragement is encouraging an ideology that they're against, right? Saying that, you know, Armenians have suffered is not enough. That's not enough. It's never been enough quite frankly, and it's not enough now, it's especially not enough now, because we are now seeing what those forces are, right? We're seeing, you know, whether it's pipeline issues, energy, now we're seeing what the story's really about. And so we have to start talking about it in the language that the rest of the world actually cares about. We can't be talking about it in the language, you know, unfortunately, and I, I work a lot in human rights, but I have to say, human rights is, 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 is the victim's discourse. You know, you don't, you know, it's a victim's discourse or a colonizer's discourse in some ways, right? If they're doing it for the right reasons, whether it's democracy or freedom or whatever it is. Um, but we have to start understanding what causes these things to take place from an economic standpoint. I'm going to come full circle to why um, Umin Kurt was, uh, you know, and we, we spoke about the fact that what happens if we approach war crimes and human rights violations not from uh, the human rights legal discourse, but from identifying what those economic forces are that are driving them. Then people will start caring. If I find out what your interest is in, you know, in the blockade of the, and there are economic interests in the, in the blockade of Artsakh today. Once those are exposed and you attack those, then everybody's all ears because you're you, you're talking about the things that they care about. The human rights aspect is the is the uh, is the wonderful byproduct that you're achieving with that. But I think for, for and and, I, and the reason I bring up Umit Kurt is because I think that his study of, of how the um, the genocide was perpetrated in this one city, you know, made it clear to me that you know we're you know. We need to be attacking the interests, and it's not just political interests, there's economic interest groups that benefit from every state action. Who are they, especially an autocratic state? Who are they? You know, who are the European powers that are living? You know, we look at, it's, it's true everywhere. We see it even in, you know, sanctions against Iran. Yes, there's a human rights element to it, but there's also an economic element to it. What is that element? How do we, and so this takes, I think, a different kind of a more, sophisticated approach, because what's happened now proves to us that it's not knowledge of human rights violations that makes the world act. We know that. We have, we've lived it. People don't care. That's not what drives 
decision makers. You know, the legal arguments are, you know, they're, they're clean because they are subtracted from all of these outside economic forces and political, to some extent, from political issues. Um, and you're dealing with just, you know, has this violation of international law occurred? It's a very simple, you know, I mean, I don't want to say simple, but it's a very um, concrete uh, indicator. There's an entire mess of interests that are not human rights based that are driving a lot of the suffering that people, Armenians and other people in, in, in various places in the world face. And I think that the real solution is to identify those and attack those. Um, we know that from cultural, from cultural heritage, right? We, we look at it from, let's say, a, a human rights perspective or a national dignity standpoint. But the museums don't. The museums have actual financial interests involved. So I, that's, you know, and so I think it's, it takes a little bit more digging for us to understand why. And I'm, and I'm happy you raised the question because it has been something that plagued me for many, many years. Like I, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe. It. I thought it was just about knowledge. If people find out, they would do the, you know, that's a language I care about. But that doesn't mean just like we know about it, you know, because I care about it doesn't mean the next guy does. And I can assure you that the perpetrator does. One more question. Thank you, Kathy, for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question of, uh, kind of related to what you were just talking about, about this, the real solution being uncovering, well, first identifying, uncovering, and then attacking these true interests in the region. Uh, however, I do feel in some ways we have been doing that. I mean, there have been articles published about the ways in which Azerbaijani money was being laundered in London real estate. There have been articles about the ways in which Azerbaijan has been selling natural gas to Europe through, uh, basically it's Russian natural gas being, you know, laundered through Azerbaijan. So there have been articles doing this, uh, specifically targeting the vested interest of um, people's uh, people in Azerbaijan uh, making money and others in Europe making money off of Azerbaijan laundering things. Any case, uh, it's not enough. It, it's really, I don't see, I, I would like to see some hope in that endeavor. And whether we can do it better, if you have ideas about how to do that in a more effective way, or to do it in a way that's more vocal. Um, but I, I, I've already seen, I feel, some of that uncovering happening, but I would like to see, hear your thoughts about how to make it more effective and actually have some change on the ground, especially when it comes to this external self-determination. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, first of all, I think that the, um, uh, that the, narratives, uh, the narratives that kind of push the, the value, the, the importance of self-determination, I think are having, there, there's some cracks in the, there's some cracks in the armor. Um, you know, I mentioned the, the Olaf Scholz statement, which really, um, was, I don't want to say it was surprising because it was, uh, you know, after a, a meeting with the Armenian foreign minister that he, you know, uh, that he spoke of, he mentioned the word self-determination, which, you know, really has been out of the discourse for a good two years. Um, and building that foundation takes, you know, not only kind of legal argument, but people to kind of understand, again, like I said, the why. Um, in terms of exposing, so I do think that, you know, um, kind of, you know, uh, constant strikes at the brick wall um, eventually bring about, you know, bring about a hole. Um, and I think we're seeing since the start of that. I think the discussion of self-determination now is becoming one that is, uh, that is going to find its way back into the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, status issue, conflict issue, uh, and, and things of that nature. In terms of um, attacking or identifying, um, there have been, and you're right, there have been, much, there's been much more. I think the Armenian community, uh, writ large, I think learned a lot from the war um, about how things work, right? I think that we really learned that, you know, you, it's not about how many followers you have on Twitter in the case of Kim Kardashian or even what position this Armenian holds, and that, that there are really kind of strong forces that kind of dictate the direction that Western society is pushing stories. Um, and, and so, and I think that now, since the war, there's been a lot of, 
there have been a lot of successes in uncovering right the, these facts um, regarding uh, you know whether it's you know the Azerbaijani laundromat or otherwise. There's also other ones that are that are not out there. When you say we haven't done enough, I mean you know the the role of Israel in the war um, is really you know I'd written an article prior to the war regarding um, Aliyev's meeting with Netanyahu. Um, and it's really shocking because that, that one really kind of drives it in, in two places, right? It deals with the whole, you know, self-determination issue in a lot of ways, right? Uh, and it also deals with the weapons issue. And there were reports um, in our research that we found from 2012 of um, Israeli bases in Azerbaijan just to have a, nor a flank from the north, from you know, the north of Iran. So there's there's a lot of those types of issues that haven't really come out or haven't been developed further. But exists. I mean, there's some Reuters reporting, but it kind of disappears. disappears. No one connects the dots. Um, from a legal standpoint, I think what 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 we need to do and haven't really done is act upon um, some of these new discoveries and, and and really try to get creative in identifying ways to hold people to account um, for their participation or their aiding and abetting or encouragement of these types of human rights violations for personal profit, and that happens a lot. In fact, that's not unique to the Armenian situation. It's just that it's a lot, um, it's, a, it's, it's a lot more difficult, right? It's, it, you know, when you see a human rights violation in law school, we're kind of taught, okay, what happened here? This is obviously a tort. This is something that happened. How do we deal with this? Well, this is the duty. This is what, okay, that's one thing. But when you're looking, when you're digging, especially in this aiding and abetting world where you have Party, uh, parties that are involved, encouraging, you know, that's often a lot more clandestine than what we see happening. I mean, there's the blockade, for example. We see that, we hear that, um, but we don't really know what the actual forces underlying all of that are. And I think that what we need to do as those, as those, as those facts are discovered, there need to be, in my opinion, and this is kind of a multi-jurisdictional approach, there need to be uh, cases brought against individuals and companies um, that are involved. And that requires some really creative lawyering. Um, it really requires pretty sophisticated lawyering in that you know you have jurisdictional issues, both sub subject matter jurisdiction and personal jurisdiction issues. Like, you know, can you bring this type of case? Can you bring this type of case against this person in this court? Um, whatever that court is. Um, so th there's a lot of, you know, it, it takes an army. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that's going to require some, some development, you know. Um, I think we've seen the, the value of doing that because the one thing we have now that we didn't have in, 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 uh, in, during World War I is Armenia is a state and therefore has some sovereign um, abilities. What the ICJ case would never have happened uh, 100 years ago because we didn't even have standing to bring a case like that. Um, so I think that in the legal field at least, um, We've done a lot in, in, in trying to um, push Armenian sovereignty and Armenian interests in a way that will make a difference to actual human lives. Um, but I do think that um, there's a lot more to be done. There's no question there's a lot more to be done. Um, and there's also, you know, unfortunately, there's the, the idea of combating narratives too. Um, I, I think, you know, there's there's been, you know, quite a bit, and like I said before, in terms of um, you know, the difference when you have an autocratic government as opposed to, you know, a democratic society, and a lot of Armenians live in democratic societies as well, you know, no one's getting a memo of saying, you know, this is the story, this is what you're going to stick, with. but that's actually what happens um, with, you know, with Azerbaijan. So that's, it, that's a challenge. I mean, there's no question about that. That's a challenge. So it's two ways. Not only do we have to develop these and then actually take some, some actual legal actions based on this information, um, uh, but we also have to combat, you know, the, uh, the, the countermeasures. And it's a very uh, well-oiled machine, you know, no pun intended. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. I think I speak for all of us when I say thank you so much for this amazing talk and for your work um, in general. Thank you. Thank you. Side of Illinois celebrates. I brought my son with me today because today is Casimir Pulaski Day, and everyone's wondering, like, what's Casimir Pulaski? We have that day off, so he's off of school today. And when you walk back through uh, Harvard, there's actually a huge statue of Casimir Pulaski, and I always wondered what that, you know, why it was there. But he was a, a Polish mercenary who fought in the uh, American Revolutionary War, so 
Um, that's why that's why I'm able to bring him with me. Today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.